Okay, I think I think we should start now. And uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. De William Sontag, from the Oklahoma University of Oklahoma Health Science Center. And as you know, he's the director of the, the aging research group in the Oklahoma. And uh, I, he's a well-known, very well-known scientist in the field of the growth hormone, IGF-1, and uh, aging. And uh, I, I met him almost 20 years ago, first time, when I was a postdoc. And since then, I, I'm very lucky to have a chance to work with him very closely. And uh, it, it has been a really privilege to, to work with him. The reason is that I personally feel that he's uh, one of the best, if not the best, scientists in the aging research. The, who has the, the, the very high quality of the research and the, the data, and also the high integrity, and also the great personality. The, the similar to Dr. Mazaro or the Dr. George Martin in the aging, the, the aging research. And uh, I'm very the, lucky to work with him, and I think we are very lucky to have him here today. But, I usually this the introduction the every time he visits here and uh, for those who never heard this introduction I want to just uh, the repeat this one Dr. Sontag work in the aging research in the Wake Forest University the years and the years and he had multiple the R ones and also the program project for the the many years but there is one problem over there he cannot watch the basketball. He likes the Wake Forest University basketball team so much, he cannot watch the game. His heart starts pounding. And one day, he realized he cannot continue to do that. Then he decided to move to Oklahoma. Then he is free from the Wake Forest basketball team, but there is a problem. There is an NBA team, the, the Oklahoma Thunder. But he has less issue because, the, as you all of we know, Oklahoma Thunder cannot reach the NBA Finals because of the presence of our San Antonio Spurs. <laughs> well, as a, the, the, <laughs> my, the, the, as a token of my appreciation and also the reminder, this is the, the, the gift I bought yesterday for Dr. Sontag. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> I think I should better stop now. Yeah, I think you should. So, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Everybody knows Tim was the one Forest. That was my gift to you folks is that, you know, Wake Forest gave you Tim. It was many good years that you had him. I thought we'd, I'd feel the same way about Durant, but he's now someplace else. Okay. So, Yuji, thank you very much, and uh, I have to tell you that he only likes me because the first time he met me, I gave him a positive review on a program project. Okay, so I, I think that's how I, I got it uh, uh, endeared to him. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for the introduction. Um, what I'm going to try to do today is give you my perspective on IGF-1, and I've been here before, and we've been doing this, but... I'm going to go over some data that I've talked about before, some data that's new, but try to put IGF-1 in a perspective that begins to make sense. As you probably know, and I will remind you, this is, has been and continues to be a highly controversial field. What is IGF-1 doing? And is it good for you? Is it bad for you? And I think that we're beginning, and I don't have a definitive answer at this point, but we're beginning to reveal, with Yuji's help, because he did all, all of the pathology for us, um, of, of the role that IGF-1 has during aging. So, with that in mind, um, we're going to talk about the axis as a whole. For those of you that may not be aware of growth hormone in IGF-1 and the regulation, look at the effects of IGF deficiency on both vascular and brain function. This is where we've really hunkered down and tried to make the most progress with understanding really what IGF-1 does. We have a lot more work to, to, 
to do in this area. I'm going to, um, at the end of this, we'll talk about a holistic view of IGF-1. Does it have a role? Is it a compound that exhibits antagonistic pleiotropy? Uh, a number of you know what that concept is, some don't. Um, but antagonistic pleiotropy, um, uh, a layman's term would be good genes that go bad as you age. And so factors that are important at, during, de during de development eventually are deleterious for you as you get older. And IGF-1, we've thought for years, could potentially fit in that category. Um, I'm also going to mention some data on the developmental origins of disease, which I think is a role that IGF-1 can play as well in an area that we're interested in. So um, I don't need to tell this to all of you, but to some, why do we study aging? Um, and these graphs really reflect it quite well that diseases increase as a function of age. That before the age of 50 or so, the incidence of stroke is minim minimal. There is virtually no one or very few people before age of 50 that show signs of stroke. After the age of 50, it increases in a dramatic fashion. And uh, we can look at a number of other diseases as well. They increase as a function of age. And so what is it about the organism that has changed that is allowing the permissive environment for diseases to take hold? That's a question that we need to address, and one that we have been, been addressing for some time with insulin-like growth factor 1. Now, uh, the axis we'll be dealing with are um, uh, we, uh, the hypothalamus um, is uh, uh, just above the pituitary gland. And it secretes it, uh, at least two hormones that control uh, growth hormone output, GHRH, growth hormone releasing hormone, and somatostatin. GHRH increases growth hormone output somatostatin decreases growth hormone output. The dynamic interchange between these two drive a pulsatile output of growth hormone that affects hepatic cells to secrete IGF-1. That's a very simplistic approach, but it's the model we'll be going with right now. Their IGF-1 also has a number of binding proteins as well, um, uh, and there's paracrine activity of IGF-1 I'll describe in just a little bit. We've known for some time that IGF-1 decreases as we get older. This is data from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging, showing that uh, at the age of 20 or so, we have high concentrations. Um, I if I'm right, this is growth hormone, yes, up here, and it decreases with age. And IGF-1 decreases with age. It reaches uh, its peak between um, uh, the ages of 10 and 20, and then decreases from that point in both males and females. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Is this all bioavailable, or is, you know, like the I've talked to, and, you know, and, and, and my colleagues, where are you? <laughs> there. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I, I will hedge on that because um, there's some controversy depending on who you talk to, what, whether you can measure bioavailable. Some people report that they have, and uh, this is total. Okay? Right. Okay. And so uh, whether it's uh, now a large part of this is not bioavailable because the binding to BP3 is, is uh, fairly high, okay? And so there's uh, a low percentage of IGF-1 that's supposedly free, okay? And then we get into the other binding proteins in the tissue as well that have high af 
uh, high affinity binding for IGF-1, and uh, we need a protease to degrade the, the binding proteins to allow IGF-1 to interact with its receptor site. In addition, the binding proteins may have their own role, okay? And there's a whole other field of work of do the binding proteins have specific actions? Are they important for aging or, or not? There's been actually very little work in that area, but it needs to, to be done, okay? All right, so a long time ago, you know, when I was first, a, this is I think the first study I did when I was a postdoctoral fellow, um, uh, we put a, ca a catheter in, in into a uh, Fisher 344 uh, rat, and we looked at pulsatile release of GH. Uh, the animal is alive and awake and moving around its cage, and if you do the study that way and the animal is unstressed, you see these high amplitude pulses that are occurring in the rodent models every three and a half hours or so. This is the dark phase of the light dark uh, cycle, and we have a pulse of, uh, of uh, growth hormone that is, a, that is occurring there as well. And this happens throughout the day and, and night. These are well characterized pulses. With age, there's a decline in the amplitude of growth hormone output, and so uh, the uh, periodicity of growth hormone doesn't appear to change, but with the decline in the amplitude of the pulses, it's really difficult to make that interpretation. Okay, I've shown you that IGF-1 decreases with age in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of uh, Aging. IGF-1 decreases with age in mice, in rats, in uh, most uh, animal species that have been tested to date. So the uh, decline with age in IGF-1 is a robust marker of aging. Uh, in our rodent models, what we find is high concentrations uh, uh, about uh, one to two months of age, and then it declines from that point. That's the gray shaded area here. And what we have developed are animal models where we can intervene, where we can either increase IGF-1 or decrease IGF-1 at various ages. Now, previous models have used the AIMS dwarf, which is a, uh, has a mutation in a gene that makes the cells for GH in the pituitary gland. And so they have a profound deficiency in growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor one. They also have a deficiency in TSH and ACTH as, as well. Um, and so in the Ames dwarf, uh, the concentrations of IGF-1 are actually a little bit less than this, uh, but about 100 nanograms per mil in that ballpark. Um, the, we have developed a lid mouse where uh, 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 it's a takeoff on what other uh, folks have used. This is a uh, hepatic de uh, driven Cree that decreases IGF-1, so the um, animal is an IGF-1 flock. And so we can decrease IGF-1 around postnatal day 10 when uh, this gene is being made. In addition, we can use a viral vector approach and knock IGF-1 down at any other age we want by using a TBG-specific Cree. So we use an AAV TBG Cree, hepatic-specific again. That's a uh, injection into the vasculature, and uh, uh, it's expressed only in hepatic cells, and it drives down the circulating IGF-1. It does not have an effect on brain IGF-1 or any paracrine uh, uh, output of IGF-1. We can also do that at 15 months of age and drive down IGF-1. So with this in mind, we can begin to ask questions about when during life uh, deficiency of IGF-1 is important. Is it early life? Is it midlife? Is it late life? Uh, now. 
let's just uh, con continue our conversation about insulin-like growth factor one. Um, I told you that IGF-1 was made in tissues as well. It's not only hepatic, uh, uh, made by hepatic cells, but it is also made in numerous other tissues as, as well. So the brain makes its own IGF-1. And so one thing that we want to do is make sure that when we knock IGF-1 down, that we know what paracrine IGF-1 is actually doing. Is there compensation? Is there not? What is the change with age in brain levels of IGF-1? And that's done here where we look at brain levels of IGF-1. And to do this, I'm sorry, this is serum concentrations of IGF-1 here. Here is CSF concentrations of IGF-1 going down with age. Here's hippocampal concentrations of IGF-1 decreasing with age. And cortical levels of IGF-1 decreasing as a function of age. Now, to do this study, what we've done is to perfuse the uh, IGF-1 out of the vasculature because the vasculature contains a high dose of IGF-1, high concentration of IGF-1. So we have to wash the IGF-1 out of the vasculature and look at the IGF-1 that remains in the rest of the tissue. Um, kidney, uh, I mean, you know, we're talking about in, in the brain. Good question. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> it's, it's coming. Um, and so let's talk about the effects of growth hormone IGF-1 on, um, on, uh, uh, on the brain. It's cognitive and vascular effects both. And this was a study we did with Alicia Markoska when she was at Hopkins, it was actually the first study that uh, we did with replacement of IGF-1 in the brain. As a person with an endocrinology background, if you see a deficiency in a hormone, the first thing you want to do is let's put it back, see what behaviors come back. And that's what we did. This is a Morris maze, and uh, what Alicia did is uh, uh, study uh, uh, the behavior of these animals, for those of you that don't know, it's a big horse trough where you have a hidden platform. You put the animals in, and uh, after trial, after trial, after trial, it's actually quite boring uh, for the person that's doing it, exciting for the um, animal, of course. And eventually, they find the hidden platform. Now, if they don't find it in the first round, Okay, they're put on the platform and they kind of look around and they see the cues that are, are around. And then you take them off back to the home cage and then a few minutes after that there's another trial until they learn the task. And so all these animals are, are able to acquire the task. They're able to encode where the location of the platform is. Then we play a trick during a probe trial. We, we take the platform out and we see how much time they spend around where the platform was um, or wh where they, um, uh, or if their search is directly over where the platform was. Uh, the annulus 40 time is shown here. Animals that are young have learned the task well and their performance is quite high. Older animals injected with saline don't do this task well. They don't re recall where the platform was, older animals injected with IGF-1 have a partial recovery of their function. At the same time, if we look at actual the precise number of crossings over exactly where the platform was, animals that are young do it well, older uh, animals injected with saline uh, don't do it particularly well, older animals infused with IGF-1 have an improvement in their cognitive function. So. Um, a very robust study showing that IGF-1 indeed has an effect on cognitive function. In addition, we've gone beyond that, and with the viral vector approaches that we have, we're able to go into the, into the hippocampus, which is the specific region of brain that mediates learning in this case. We have a hippocampally dependent 
behavioral task, and we inject a viral vector um, that is expressed and follows, this is CA1 area of the hippocampus, this is CA3 over here, and the dentate over here, and this viral vector follows this tract, one injection of the viral vector will follow this back and block um, uh, uh, IGF and uh, block IGF-1 uh, in that specific region of brain. We can also do this with the receptor for IGF-1, but this is blocking IGF-1. Uh, in this case, uh, we, uh, the acquisition phase animals that are young uh, do this task fairly well. They acquire the task, their performance improves. Um, with a brain Cree or a liver and brain Cree, okay, um, we have a impairment in their acquisition curves, okay? So they don't encode the information appropriately. Uh, they do show a slight bit of, of improvement, but it's not nearly as uh, uh, robust as animals that are young. And then if we look at exploration time on target, um, uh, it's uh, our control animals are here, uh, animals injected with the brain, uh, specific Cree are shown here, and uh, both hepatic and brain free are shown here, okay? So we have a uh, 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 impairment in their cognitive function when you knock IGF-1 down, either the paracrine IGF-1 or both paracrine and uh, endocrine IGF-1. Uh, now, this is knocking insulin like growth factor one receptor down. So we're again, by using a mouse model, we have, um, uh, uh, we are uh, injecting an AAV, Cree, um, uh, and uh, the animals injected with Cree show um, a, a improvement in their cognitive function uh, it's um, not as robust as animals injected with the GFP. So again, we have a deficiency when we knock out the receptor for IGF-1. Um, uh, and uh, if we continue to train these animals, 100% um, of the mice can eventually find where the platform is. Um, uh, and if we look at the expression of IGFR, we're decreasing it by about 50%. And uh, we can also do a reversal where we um, uh, look at their ability to go to a different location in, in this specific task. And animals injected with Cree have a harder time doing the reversal task. I do apologize, I forgot to tell you that the test we're using here is a radial arm maze, not, not the water maze. And the radial arm maze looks like this when you first start off. Uh, if the platform is here, uh, animals spend a lot of time someplace else. And uh, the, the more white and red areas here show the amount of time they're spending there. After they're trained, they go directly to where the platform is so they can learn where, where the task is. Now, in rat models, we've been able to do um, additional tests because rats, um, you have a more broad-based type of behavioral testing that you can do com compared to mice. Jim. Mm -hmm. in terms of these kinds of measures of cognitive. We have never done any studies with the AIMS or the SNEL, and I would like to. Um, the problem with all behavioral tasks, as you're very aware, 
is what is the motivation for the animal to perform? And, uh, you know, I mean, we, I, can, I struggle with this a lot, uh, especially, and we generally do two or three different types of tests. Uh, the Ames dwarf has a problem with temperature can, uh, control, okay? Um, and so that wipes out any kind of a water-based test because the motivational aspects will be different. Um, the IGFRs, uh, the only ones we've used are these that, the, uh, that where the IGFR is flocked so we can induce it when the animal's an adult. We don't, we have avoided doing studies of early life knockout of IGF-1 because of the developmental effects of IGF-1. And uh, uh, again, I'm torn, okay, by is that important or not? And I don't have an answer that it is or, or, or not. Why well, I am, I'm concerned about it. I'm concerned about it enough that if what our question is, is what are the consequences of the deficiency of IGF-1 with age, then the model we have to use has to be adult onset. Now, you can ask the question a different way and say, does IGF-1 during development have an effect? And that's fine. But we, we haven't asked that question quite yet, okay? So. Yeah. <clears throat> Andre Barkey uh, reported that in his work he uh, proved um, the, our, our test of um, uh, happy dwarfs. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, have you done happy dwarfs in, with your animals? And, uh, yes. And it's a test, that, you know. Um, um, <laughs> as a person with a behavioral background, um, the difficulty with any behavioral task, and passive avoidance is one, and you have to, you know, is um, uh, when, how do you record an animal as knowing s something when they don't perform? And passive avoidance, by definition, the animal doesn't move, okay? So if they don't move, you record that as a, memory of the task. Well, we have a lot of uh, animals that um, sometimes say, thank you very much. Um, I'm not participating in this test. I'm going into my corner. I'm going to sleep. And how do you handle that data? Um, uh, and so we look very closely at the performance that, that the animals have. Um, and, it, it, you know, it, it has to be a judgment call at some point. I personally don't use a pass avoidance test. We have used that once we saw the data and, you know, the number of animals that weren't performing. We went to an active avoidance test. And active avoidance will show a difference with deficiency of IGF-1. Okay? But the animals have to be doing something in order to record that they have a memory of the event. Okay, and so it's, uh, that's why we haven't used the passive voids in our hands. It doesn't work well. Well, well it depends on, on what the endpoints are. If, if you measure the success of the test that they've learned by the animal not moving, that's a problem. Okay, and so all of those tests that are, pot are, are potentially um, uh, uh, d done that way, uh, we don't use for that very, that very problem. Um, how, you know, but you can change those tests around and, and, and they, can, they potentially can work quite well. Remember that if you're doing a hippocampally dependent task, um, you know, you, uh, you know, that's in a specific area of brain. If you're doing a fear-mediated task, that's another area of brain. And so uh, it, it depends on what the task is and the area of brain you're trying to correlate the data with. That doesn't mean that, you know, a lot of the other areas aren't involved. I don't mean to say that. But... Prim prim primarily, um, you know, we go after the hippocampally dependent tests, the classic tests that are known and accepted in the field, okay? 
and, uh, uh, and, and where we can get reliable uh, data where the animal is active and moves, okay? And I will be very frank, we have never seen an animal with a deficiency of IGF-1 that performs be better in any of the tasks we've ever run, and, we, and we've run a lot, okay? So uh, I, I think almost all of our animal models, because we're correlating whether they're blood flow or s something else, we're looking um, at behavior a lot, and we never see an improvement of function with a deficiency of IGF-1. Yeah? The other problem with management of talent, I'm a little vague on this, but I think maybe we're supposed to brand IGF-1 as chronic disease. Right, and I'll go into that in, in, in a little bit, okay? So, because that's another caveat that we began to address before, paracrine IGF-1. Well, if the brain is compensating, and there's an increase in paracrine IGF-1, then you don't have a deficiency in IGF-1, okay? You have an excess. And so you have to, and that's why we spent a great deal of time investigating IGF-1 in the cerebral spinal fluid. We've looked at it in, 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 uh, in, in the brain, in the, uh, both in the hippocampus and in the cortex. So. All of that is part of uh, our investigation into what an IGF-1 does, okay? So, okay. Um, in rat models, you can, uh, their performance is more complex uh, than mice, and they're easier to work with. Um, but uh, using the Morris maze, you can divide their cognitive function up into cognitively intact or cognitively impaired. About 50% of animals as they age show cognitive impairment. The other 50% are about like animals that are young. And so you can use this as a assessment of, gee, what correlates with what's going on in their hippocampus, in, in their brain? And so we've done that. Here are their uh, performance in the Morris maze, um, adult, aged, intact, aged, impaired. And we can correlate that with the perfusion index for the whole brain, okay? And what we find, and we're kind of surprised that this works, um, proximity to platform, which is one of the endpoints from the uh, Morris maze, correlates fairly well with the whole brain perfusion index. The more blood flow, the higher the cognitive performance that the animal shows, okay? And I, I, I find that remarkable that a behavior test correlates with anything, the, that uh, some other de dependent variable with the kind of variance that we normally get in behavioral tests. Yeah. Males. We'll talk about females a after a while. Um, and so, if you do this by bold, you find that um, uh, uh, animals that are adult have good blood flow in brain. Uh, animals that are aged have a decrease in, in blood flow. Um, these are intact. Uh, perf uh, their performance is intact. If their performance is impaired, there's a further decline in blood flow. And it was the first indication that we had, there was a relationship between blood flow and behavioral outcomes. So, the vasculature is important. There's a lot of it. Uh, for many years, I tried to ignore it. It was that thing that I had to get through to get to those in, in, uh, the important parts of brain. But the vasculature is ubiquitous, of course, okay? It has to carry all, all of the nutrients back and forth to and from uh, b b various cells. And in the brain, it's especially dense. In the brain, uh, as you know, has a high oxygen and energy requirement. Uh, it has a lot uh, of microvessels that are there. Um, and uh, uh, if there's impairment in the cerebrovasculature, it leads to uh, neuronal dis dysfunction. So, 
Um, again, an older study that we did, this was actually done when I was at Wake. Um, a colleague of mine who was a vascular specialist said, well, Bill, why don't we do something uh, uh, with the brains of the animals that you have? We can put a cranial window and we can follow that for months, okay? And indeed, he could. Um, and we had the animals and we did this study. Here's an animal that's young. There's a plastic chamber here, but you can look down at the surface of brain and see the vasculature this there. Here's an animal that's um, older. And I'm not talking about the big vessels that, that are here. They're obviously that those are, uh, at least in this model, is uh, are uh, uh, going away, okay? But um, we're looking at vessels that you can't see in a specific region of brain, and these are the peel vessels that are going over the surface of brain that then dive down into the cortex. And the beauty of those is that in this preparation, they're easy to count. And so you can go to the same area of brain, and you can just count the number that are there and use that as an index of, of the microvasculature that's uh, in the tissue. And if we look at the arteriolar density, it decreases by, oh, 30 to 40 percent in that ballpark uh, with age. The connections between the arterioles decreases over 50 percent, and the venule density decreases as well. But we can do one more thing. We can give growth hormone back to increase IGF-1, and we can then follow what happens to the number of vessels that are on the surface of brain diving down into cortex. And you can record a before you start the study and then after 30 days, which is what, what we did in this case. We gave growth hormone injections twice per day. Animals that are young are shown here, old are shown here, old with growth hormone shown here. And none of these two groups showed a change in the vessel density where when we gave growth hormone, we got a large rise in the vessel density that's there. So growth hormone had an angiogenic effect on the arterioles that are diving down into the cortex. Then we went ahead and looked at the density of capillaries. Now, again, we did growth hormone injections for 30 days. And in hindsight, I wish we'd done it for longer because we were getting effects, but I, I think if we went for a longer period of time, we would have gotten really robust effects. But in CA1, we counted the number of vessels that were there, uh, CA3 and the dentate, young, old and old with growth hormone replacement, CA1, we get an increase in the amount of vessels that are there. Young, old, the number of, of capillaries uh, is slightly going down. That's not a significant change, but we did get a significant increase compared to old in the number of vessels in CA3. In the dentate, there were trends in these data, but that was not a significant change. So th just 30 days of growth hormone replacement. Think about this. You're deficient in growth hormone from probably the time you're 30 um, to, well, a few of you probably aren't even over 30 yet, okay? But until you're my age, and, you know, and we can be replacing vessels very effectively. We can be growing new vessels in brain. Um, in addition, we've looked at the animal that's flocked, the mouse that's flocked, injected with AAV TBG Cre, okay, to drive down the circulating IGF-1. And when we do that, we get a decrease in the uh, cortical microvascular um, density compared to injecting GFP. So again, even in the mouse, we get a deficiency in, uh, in the vasculature in response to a deficiency in IGF-1. Now, my colleagues have also looked at oxidative stress in uh, brain, and the model they like to use is a hypertension model. And so um, they look at oxidative stress in young 
and uh, young that are hypertensive. Here's older and older animals that are hypertensive. And you see the increase in oxidative stress uh, with uh, age when you challenge with a hypertensive, uh, a hyper, uh, hypertensive challenge. Um, and so that's shown here uh, that young um, uh, under baseline status, young with hypertension, um, old and old with hypertension, and then when it's uh, blocked o over here. So again, older animals are more responsive to the hypertensive challenge. In addition, what they did is to look at um, the antioxidant defense pathway here. And here they've looked at IGF-1 uh, effects on NERF-2. And if you look over here, the expression of the NERF-2, by the way, this is in a uh, uh, IGF flox injected with an AAV-8 MUP Cree, that's still a hepatic specific Cree. So we're driving down circulating IGF-1. And uh, uh, NRF2 expression goes down. And the end products of uh, action of NRF2 are expression of GCLC, NQO1, HMOX1, and catalase. And in all cases, here they're challenging with uh, high glucose or peroxide. And the control animals are shown here. The animals that are deficient in IGF-1 are shown here in black. And in all cases, uh, when you're deficient in IGF-1, you are not inducing this antioxidant pathway. And that's shown for all of these downstream uh, genes important for NERF-2. Yeah. Um, these, yes, uh, these are done in aortic slices. After the injection of the, of the yes. Okay. The, uh, the Cree is done probably two months before. So we drive IGF-1. Our viral vectors generally take to get the full decrease in IGF-1 uh, two weeks, okay, a bit before the IGF-1 has dropped. Uh, to where uh, where it's stable. So you're looking at a chronic IGF-1 deficiency. That's correct. So, for example, if you cut all IGF-1 back to the beginning, the cycle um, We haven't looked at that yet. That's a, a good thought, but we just haven't done that because we're do dealing with a chronic deficiency. You know, you know, it, it, but it could work. Okay, but we but we have not done that. that that's a very good point. Okay, um, now. Um, in addition to um, investigating the uh, oxidative stress and, and the NERF-2 pathway in brain, um, uh, my colleagues and I have become interested in um, uh, microhemorrhages that are occurring in brain. And these are very small breaks in the blood-brain barrier that allow leakage of compounds from the plasma into the brain. Um, that's, not, that's not good for you, okay? It induces an, an immune response. And so we're talking about very small breaks uh, in the blood-brain barrier. It is the rupture of these small vessels. And it's a phenomenon that increases substantially with age. So it's well known to take place, and uh, we've modeled this in our, uh, our animal models and our, uh, 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 our IGF phloxed mice. Uh, what we, in, if we just look at age first, these are animals that are young. They're injected, I'm sorry, they're uh, implanted with an angiotensin pump. Now, there's numerous ways to induce hypertension in a mouse. This is one. It's not the only way, okay? It's the easiest way, okay? Um, and we do this study, and animals that are young show uh, 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 a, a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and these microhemorrhages. Um, 
about 20 to 30 percent or so over an eight-day period. Here's an aged animal here, about 22 months of age, C57 black six. Look at the dynamic and robust breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. It's a phenomenal increased uh, response to hypertension, okay? And it's an example uh, that I like to use of geroscience as a field. What is going on in uh, hypertension in a young person is there. You can measure it, but the, it's not the manifest as frank pathological change. In an older person, that hypertension can be devastating because of things like this, where you get a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Pam. So you're saying that young doesn't eventually get there. It repairs or, or uh, just allows for damage. So it plateaus at a lower level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we haven't gone out beyond too much beyond the 10 days because all of the aged animals are, are impaired. Okay, so, you know, it, it, um, we haven't taken, I guess if, if we continue this in young, I don't know where they plateau. But certainly the timing of this, you know, is a lot faster in animals that, that are older. Is the same, yes. Okay, we're able to monitor that. And, uh, you know, the angiotensin pumps are very good at giving a consistent rise in BP to about 160 or so. Okay, so it's within a physiological range that you, well, not that hypertension is physiological, but it's within the range that you would normally see in a hypertensive adult. Okay, Pam? You must have been a reviewer for some grant of mine at some point. <laughs> no, we have not done a middle age. I mean, you we're dealing with almost a proof of concept here before we investigate mechanisms. Jim? What was that third? The third is they were doing a res, res, resveratrol study at the time. And so that's uh, aged that are hypertensive injected with res resveratrol, this seems to have a very protective action on the blood vessels, okay? And they've published a lot uh, on this topic. So how that works, eh, we don't know yet, okay? So, um, okay. So uh, again, we're dealing with um, uh, um, leakage across the blood-brain barrier, uh, animals that are young, animals that are hypertensive, shown here, and this is the amount of leakage across the blood-brain barrier. We're looking at, um, at, um, uh, at fluorescein in this case, animals that are old, animals that are old that are hypertensive, and we're looking at the hippocampus, the cortex, and, and the white matter as well. And we're comparing three versus 24. So again, you see that there's leakage across the blood-brain barrier. Now. Um, what happens in response to a deficiency of IGF-1? Um, and we can do the same types of studies we did before. We can look at lesion volume uh, uh, is what we're doing in this case. And again, we have the animals that are the flocks to IGF-1, uh, hepatic specific CRE to drive IGF-1 down. They're that way for about two months or so. And then uh, uh, we induce a hypertension uh, and look at the size of, of um, mm -hmm. lesions that are formed. And compared to the control group, the lesions are bigger um, and, uh, than, uh, and uh, they are, uh, there are more of them in the animals that are deficient in IGF-1, showing that there is a role for IGF-1 in uh, protection of the blood-brain barrier. In addition, you can do a gait analysis of animals uh, uh, as they age or in response to these challenges because you don't want to have to 
uh, take the brain out and section through a whole brain to know whether or not you have deficiencies uh, in the blood-brain barrier. Well, one test that we found that works quite well is a, uh, is a catwalk. And uh, again, we're look this doesn't come across well. We're looking at uh, hepatic-specific Cree, and so they have low levels of IGF-1 uh, in black, and we're looking at uh, characteristics with which the animals walk across this platform. And so we can break this down, and they have impairments in their walking ability, uh, and so there's various um, indices that you can go after. But changes in the brain and the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier are having effects on gait. So, and we think this may happen in people as well as they age. Um, we're showing this graph before. Uh, um, uh, Peter Toff did this study. We're looking at control animals and animals with a deficiency of IGF-1. We're looking at the incidence of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, and again, animals that are deficient in IGF-1 have a uh, more of the animals show the signs of intracerebral hemorrhage problems. Now, um, what could IGF-1 be doing within the vasculature? And uh, um, Zoltan and uh, Peter Toff uh, have been looking at MMP activity, um, and uh, we have a control group, a hypertension group, a uh, uh, animal that is deficient in IGF-1, and deficient in IGF-1 that is hypertensive. And uh, MMP activity is increased in the animals that are deficient and are hypertensive. We can look at expression of MMP2, 3, and 9 shown here. And two and three are the ones that show dramatic changes in response to hypertension when there's a deficiency of IGF-1. And they've looked at other endpoints as, as well. And so part of what IGF-1 is doing is certainly not the only aspect of, of IGF-1 action, is to interact with the blood-brain barrier to control MMP act, act, activity. Now, let's move to another aspect of the vasculature. We've talked about the density of the vasculature, which is going down with age. We've talked about breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, which is changing as a function of age and res response to deficiency of IGF-1. Let's look at neurovascular coupling. Now, neurovascular coupling is really important. When I think great thoughts, doesn't happen very often, but when I do, when the great thought is there, I have to get blood flow to that area of brain that's involved in that process. When animals do a behavioral task, they have to get blood to that specific area of brain to support the neuronal function that's going on. The brain tightly controls its blood flow at all times, and so when there's increased activity, there has to be a corresponding match of increases in blood flow in order to maintain that activity. Does that process change with age? And indeed, it, it does. Um, well, let me just say that this is um, fMRI of blood flow during a language task. Uh, here we have PET scanning um, uh, of an EBAN, uh, of an EBAN evangelist in prayer, showing that there are highly specific regions of brain that are activated during activities that we normally do. Um, and so the Ungvari laboratory has been able to perfect this, and so they look at cerebral blood flow specifically over the whisker barrel cortex. That's a highly specific region of brain. Um, uh, and as you stimulate the animal's whisker, there's an increase in blood flow in the whisker barrel cortex. It's a, a, a very nice response that you can get. So 
we can study this in our animals that are deficient in IGF-1. So we create the deficiency in IGF-1. We knock IGF-1 down. Uh, so with our hepatic specific de de deficiency, um, the amplitude of, of the impulses that are coming in from the stimulation is uh, fine. Uh, the cerebral blood flow is down in the animals that are deficient in IGF-1. That's uh, shown over here, too. There's a decline of about 30% in uh, blood flow. And so when you stimulate the whisker barrel cortex, uh, I'm sorry, when you stimulate the whisker, there's a, uh, the response you get is not sufficient. Okay, uh, there's an impairment in blood flow. Blood flow doesn't get there, okay, to stimulate the activity. And so there's something going on. We know that we have the blood vessel over here, uh, this control by NO. We think that IGF-1 has a role here. Um, we have an astrocyte. Um, we think that uh, IGF-1 has a role in astrocyte function we have the activation of, of, um, of the neuron as well, which in this specific case that we used appeared to be normal, okay? So it's not a neuronal problem coming into the whisker barrel cortex, but something down, uh, uh, downstream from that or upstream. I don't know what to call that. But it's either an astro astrocyte problem or a vascular problem that's occurring, yeah. Mm -hmm. What have studies shown in terms of timing? So is the neural activity, uh, say when you start thinking. <laughs> when you start thinking I, I don't even read it. <laughs> that never happens, Jim. <laughs> does, does the thinking, does the neural activity of thought drive the vascular, uh, increased vascularization? Is that Not, uh, let, let's be careful. Um, it's not increased vascularization, it's a dilation of the blood vessels. Yes, that, that is the concept, that as neuronal activity goes up, uh, that that drives a dilation of the blood vessels. Now, how that happens, okay, I have a model that is that uh, the Zoltan is constructing now that I'll show. He said, show this graph. <laughs> I hope I can explain it, uh, okay. so. Well, yeah, um, okay, I would be very hesitant to respond to that, okay? So it's not that that's not true, um, but it's more complicated than that, okay, so. Well, why don't you hold that a bit? Because I think when we explain a little bit more, um, I, I, I don't know where IGF-1 is actually, is actually acting, which, which is a problem. And we're trying to dissect this apart virtually cell by cell. I mean, you know, is it astrocytes? Is it neurons? Is it blood vessels? Is it endothelial cells? You know, what, what is it, okay, about IGF-1 that's doing this? And we have studies going on looking at astrocytic specific IGF-1 that we think is really important. We think that's where, all, not all for, for sure, but a lot of the paracrine IGF-1 is coming from. That doesn't mean that the vascular IGF-1, and we have animal models where we're trying to do that. They've been uh, hard to deal with because our viral vectors don't like to infect endothelial cells in vivo. They just will not do it, okay? And so we've had to go to other approaches that are, um, I think we're almost there, but until I see it, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Do you know if the, the small amounts of receptor, receptor for IGF-1 are the endothelial cells in the um, re Receptors for IGF-1 on the endothelial, yes, there are. Okay, question about Uh, 
Uh, we, we, we don't know per, the percentage rise. You know, we do know that astrocytes have a role in that, and a fairly large role, okay? How large, I can't tell you, okay? Um, and so we deal with a percentage. Is it the neurons more than um, astrocytes? No, okay? I think it's the astrocyte that has a primary role. Do I have the definitive data for that? No, I don't. That, that's a intuitive perception. Uh, 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 yeah, you know, so, Jim? Just to be sure I understand the model, this model um, is a pre-knockout. It's a endocrine model. You're yes. Out liver that's correct. And you, you don't know exactly what's going on in the brain if there's no compensation. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's that's true, and and it it it, it is okay. Um, we've used multiple ones. We, you know, we, we have neuronal specific. We have astrocytic specific. Um, uh, we have uh, we've. Many years ago, we tried a Thai II Cree, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and now we have a uh, inducible VCAD heron Cree that w we've crossed to our model. It's not ready for prime time yet. Okay, we're you know we've you know are expanding the colony now to get an experimental cohort. A floxed allele? Yeah, um, we have no, we haven't done that yet. I mean, you know, so, but but let's talk about it at, at the end. I, I want to make sure we we get through, and I don't mean to. Oh, we do a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might be here for three, which I don't want to be here for three. I'm going to dinner. <laughs> okay, so the other aspect of the vasculature is auto reg reg regulation of the vasculature. And this is a response to hypertension. And uh, the vessels themselves, here's an animal that's young. Uh, as blood pressure goes up, look at the range with which cerebral blood flow is actually stable. The brain is controlling its own blood flow, okay? It manages its blood flow in this wide range, okay? When blood pressure gets too high, um, it, it, you know, I mean, it goes up, and that's not good for, for the brain. But if uh, there's an adaptation that occurs in hypertensive, in uh, animals that are hypertensive, and so it extends this range of stability of cerebral blood flow, okay? So cerebral blood flow is stable. Look what happens with age. The autoregulation is here in response to hypertension, that response doesn't occur. And so if you get out, this is one of the problems with being old and hypertensive, is this uh, uh, there's no compensation. And so you don't, uh, your brain blood flow isn't controlled well. If your blood vessels in your brain are weak, you can break them, okay? That's the bad part about being hypertensive and older. Now, for time, I'm going to skip on a, a, a bit here. And these were just drawn by one of the graduate students, uh, Stefano um, Tarantini, who is going to be graduating, I hope, um, in uh, November or so. But the bottom line from all of this is that uh, we have the vessels going through the brain if pressure goes up, is uncontrolled in this area, we can break the blood vessels that are there, especially if they are uh, sensitive to begin with, if there's been induction of MMPs in response to a deficiency of IGF-1. And so that is part of the problem that occurs with age that contributes to the, the, um, the microhemorrhages. 
Um, and so the model is that in animals that are young, uh, the pressure goes up, the, cons the constriction goes up to control the blood, uh, the pressure in brain, the resistance goes up, and then the microvascular damage um, uh, uh, will block um, any rupture of the blood vessels. Animals that are older, when their pressure goes up, the constriction doesn't happen as effectively, the uh, resistance doesn't go up, and there's more damage. So that's the model that our colleagues are actually working with in response to both hypertension and deficiencies of IGF-1. I'm going to skip the, um, well, I, I, I won't. Where is IGF-1 going to, to work? Where do we think it's happening? IGF-1 has many actions. We think it's working on the vessel itself. Part of these can be paracrine actions of IGF-1. It, I, we think that the vessel responds to IGF-1. They have receptors for IGF-1. We think endothelial cells can make IGF-1 that may have a paracrine activity in the tissues around them. And so to support other cell types that are there, maybe the astrocytes. The astrocyte can respond to IGF-1. We know that quite well. Um, and we're doing studies now trying to look at the uh, control of um, mitochondrial met met metabolism in response to IGF-1 within the astrocytes and, of course, the neurons as well could be a target of IGF-1. So let's move on, okay, in the time that we have. Um, now, we've talked about the vasculature and brain, but let's talk about the broader scope of uh, IGF-1 and antagonistic pleiotropy. Of course, these are models we're familiar with. Uh, we know that the um, uh, IGF uh, uh, our heads um, are, uh, uh, um, are shorter, I'm sorry, are longer lived. Okay, I want to make sure I had the, the right graph here. Um, this was an older study that was done in 2002. This paper has been cited um, 1,500 times or more. Okay. Uh, this is the group of people that repeated this study and uh, didn't find these robust effects in large part because of this uh, uh, problem in the, the lifespan of the wild type, okay? Uh, and so if uh, this study is, uh, was done again and there's, uh, there are still some differences here, but they're relatively minor. They're not as robust as this study was. Uh, and of course, we know that the work of Dylan and Kenyon as well, Andres Barkey, uh, with the Ames dwarf, these are longer lived strains. And so the concept has gotten in the field the deficiency of insulin IGF-1 makes animals longer lived. Um, but based upon all the data we have, and, and again, you know, up to this point, we didn't do any, any real lifespan studies. Um, you know, it, IGF-1 is good for you, okay? It helps the vasculature. It, um, uh, it has beneficial effects on the brain, on cognitive function. So how can we deal with the discrepancy w with these two almost counterposing points of view? And we've been investigating that for some time. One of the answers, and you brought this up before, is that when Andre looks at brain levels of IGF-1, hippocampal concentrations of IGF-1 in his dwarf animals, they're compensating. Okay, they have an increase in brain IGF-1. And so uh, uh, my question then is, how can we interpret a deficiency of endocrine IGF-1, that's accurate. The animals are longer lived, that's accurate. But we cannot say it's a conserved mechanism of aging. That's inaccurate to say that because IGF-1 is actually increased in brain. We don't know what it's doing in other, uh, other areas, okay? But 
you know, it might be a sign that uh, other areas are showing increased paracrine expression of brain uh, of IGF-1 is important. Mm-mm. No, the, oh, the brains are less in size. Uh, proportionately, but the absolute size is less. And these are uh, done per wet weight. Okay, so, okay. Um, and so quite some time ago, and in this concept of conserved, the, the mechanism of uh, aging in response to deficiency of IGF-1, got even more traction to it with the Ecuadorian study that was out there that showed the Ecuadorian dwarfs um, are, are longer lived. Okay, and so, and so we published a review paper on this uh, challenging this concept. And uh, essentially we said, well, you know, if we take the data from the Ames dwarf and we extrapolate that up to, to an individual, you know, individuals should be living up to 120 or so. Well, we don't have anybody that's, you know, that's deficient in IGF-1 that lives that long. Uh, but these are the actual data from the Ecuadorian dwarfs. And um, here's the control animals going down here. And these are the Ecuadorian dwarfs uh, shown here. There's two points where there's more of the cohort alive. And so the interpretation of that is, well, these people are longer lived. I have concerns with that interpretation of data. I have no concerns with pathology, okay? And if you look at these graphs over here, what people died of, what diseases that they have. Um, well, here's the control group over here in the uh, people that are deficient in, uh, in growth hormone, uh, excuse me, the receptor for growth hormone. So they have a deficiency in IGF-1. Cardiac problems when you're deficient in uh, IGF-1 go up. Uh, cancer goes way down. That's not unexpected. We expect the IGF-1 as a a uh, growth factor has an impact on cancer, and in fact, it goes down. Um, uh, uh, I can't re read the graph as well as I'd like. Can, the convulsive problems are going way up. So some brain problem is going way up, okay? And so it's curious to us. I don't know what the etiology of that convulsive disorder actually is. But... Um, uh, <laughs> Everywhere, well, they, you know, we have an alcohol person here. What do you think? <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the number of accidents that the, uh, that the dwarf uh, people have is much higher. Okay, and... and Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, and I think that that's the gestalt that I'm trying to get to, which is not unlike the cerebrovascular problems that we've seen. In fact, um, let's go back to this model, and let me um, talk uh, ab about some data that we have. One thing that's um, garnered our attention is that IGF-1, during this peripubertal um, time uh, between the ages of 8 and 18 or so is highly variable. Okay? We go from low levels of IGF-1 to huge levels of IGF-1, and then it drops down. I'm curious, does that have any functional importance? I know, it, 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 it makes you tall, okay? It increases body mass, okay? It does all these things. But does it have any effect on lifespan, on disease, on pathology? Is it important for what happens in the future? And so that's been a question in the back of our mind for some time. And so one of the studies we did um, is we had a dwarf rat. 
And uh, uh, this dwarf rat does not show a deficiency of growth hormone until postnatal day 28, when normally growth hormone starts to rise and uh, show pulsatility. This animal can't do it. They don't have enough growth hormone secreting cells. It's relatively specific. They don't have growth hormone and they don't have prolactin. Okay, those are the two hormones they don't have. Those are the only two they don't have. They have normal TSH, ACTH, those kind of things. And we injected growth hormone for 10 weeks. We injected it from uh, postnatal day 28 and then went for 10 weeks, two injections per day, and stopped. Okay? 10 weeks, stop work, um, you know, let the animals age and see why they die. Dr. Kino is the one who was kind enough to, to do the path on, on these guys for us. What we found is that intracerebral hemorrhage, um, uh, 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 the age at which they showed it um, went up in the animals that were growth hormone replaced. About 30% of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if you were deficient in growth hormone your entire life. You lived about 31 months in that ballpark. Uh, if you were replaced with growth hormone uh, for only that 10 weeks and then stopped, the age at which you showed intracerebral hemorrhage was delayed by about 10 weeks, okay? 10 to 12 weeks, okay? And so something we did during this perinatal period lasted a lifetime. Do I know what that is? No, I don't. Okay, it's something, I suspect we did something to the vasculature, uh, some epigenetic change, but we're still in investigating that. Um, this is a more, uh, this is uh, work that UG did, uh, you know, trying to compare uh, in the wild type animals and the animals that are dwarf untreated and the animals that are dwarf treated with growth hormone for that 10 week period. And of course we see a decline in, in the amount of tumors that they have. Uh, these animals show um, a fair amount of kidney problems, 74%. Interesting to me, the dwarf animals don't show any, none, okay? It's gone, they don't show any pathology of the kidney. We inject with growth hormone for 10 weeks, we don't change that. Okay, what we did change is intracerebral hemorrhage, okay? And so uh, this went, if you're deficient in growth hormone, went from 17% to 50% and about 44% per, per, after growth hormone replacement. But what really had the impact on a lifespan here was this right here, the age at which they showed the intracerebral hemorrhage. Again, growth hormone, IGF-1, having effects somehow on the vasculature affecting lifespan. So did the animals die from cases or is it Oh, they, yes, they died of, of those. That was the cause of death. And so that was um, uh, um, um, uh, about 50% of them died of that. So when we looked at all of that data and uh, looked at it by when they died of it, then we found the difference there. Okay. So finally, let's go back to this graph and the amount of time that I have left and say, okay, let's look at pathological changes that are going on when we knock IGF-1 down at uh, postnatal day 10, uh, uh, post, uh, postnatal five month period, and after 15 months of age. And what we find here is the males are up here. Um, the wild type are in this black bar right there. The 50% line is right there. Um, animals that are lid um, at 10 days, they're knocked down at 10 days, show a trend. That's not a significant change, but it's a pretty strong trend towards a shorter lifespan. All right. Um, that's shown over here that the, the median lifespan goes down, 10% uh, survival. Uh, goes down as well. Um, and then the later we um, uh, inject our viral vector into knock IGF-1 one down, the less effect we really have. And so it's the early effect of IGF-1 that's having the effect on this shorter lifespan. Now, in the females, 
we find just the opposite effect. It's a highly, highly gender-specific effect. The wild-type animals are shown here. Our lid are shown, our lid 10-day are way out here, okay? We have a highly significant increase in their lifespan when we, in, uh, when we knock IGF-1 down at 10 days, and we also see that when we knock it down at five months of age, by 15 months of age, that effect is already is waned, and uh, so, and that's uh, data shown over here too, where the 10 day and the five month have very big effects on how long these animals live. Knock it down early, and the females live longer. In the males, just the opposite. What's that term? Uh, C57 blacks. So, um, we've also looked at the incidence of cancer. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Kino was kind enough to, um, uh, well, he was part of, of, of the grant, so we kind of had to. Um, so uh, we're looking at the incidence of cancer-induced death. Wild-type animals are shown here. These are males. These are females over here. And uh, animals that are deficient in IGF-1, um, on postnatal day 10 have an, ex uh, an acceleration of their cancer-induced death. It actually occurred a little bit earlier uh, than um, wild type. If we knock it down at five months or 15 months, we shift more towards the wild type. Uh, it, let me do, just finish this, this one thing and then we'll chat. Uh, in the wild type, uh, on the females, this is uh, the graph, and the red line is when we knock down on day 10. We have a curious shift here that I can't explain, and I'd love to know whether what somebody thinks about this. They're going along well, and then we shift over to this uh, other side, and I don't know why that happened. Rich Miller says, well, these things happen, okay? And I don't find that a, a cohesive X. X explanation. Not in this lifetime. <laughs> and then the five months of age and the 15 months of age are over here. And so we're delaying uh, the days until cancer induced death. And then we can look at other endpoints as well. And uh, uh, the, the uh, 10 day lid, uh, we reduce the uh, uh, severity of the kidney problems, and that effect wanes uh, with uh, uh, different times that we knock out the IGF-1. Uh, adenomas uh, of the pituitary gland um, are, um, uh, uh, when you have a deficiency of IGF-1, uh, they seem to go down. And in uh, male mice, uh, these are, are, the, are the kidney changes over here again. Uh, early knockout of IGF-1 uh, seems to be important for the disease process. Uh, things like kyphosis, uh, lids show more kyphosis um, at these two ages in the females. Um, in the males, the opposite effect, it's 15 months of age. So again, highly gender-specific effects in response to deficiency of IGF-1 that are sensitive to the time periods that you're knocking down IGF-1. Yeah, we did, but, you know, growth hormone, as you know, uh, pulsatile patterns, and we were trying to do things as non-invasively as possible, of course. And uh, we know the growth hormone is up, but we don't have a pulsatility um, data analysis, okay? But we know the growth hormone is up in the animals that are deficient in IGF-1. So what I've talked today about is circulating IGF-1 decreases with age, okay? And so there are profound vascular effects and neurovascular effects of IGF-1, and I won't go into all of them. Remember that 
Paracrine IGF-1 is really important in uh, how we look at data and how we interpret the effects of IGF-1. We cannot call a deficiency of endocrine IGF-1 a conserved mechanism of aging as a global statement. We have to look at paracrine IGF-1 and how that is actually, actually changing in all of these strains. And paracrine IGF-1 and the control of paracrine IGF-1 is poorly studied, okay? And um, so anyway, that's a growth area. Um, there are divergent pleiotropic effects of IGF-1. Uh, emerging data affects the IGF-1 levels around puberty have a specific and potentially long-term action on vascular function. Uh, that reduced IGF-1 in the females late in life can delay the onset of cancer. So IGF-1 in specific periods of time during a lifespan has unique effects. Okay, and so we have to get away from talking about the global changes in IGF-1 and look at the developmental effects of IGF-1, about the late life effects of IGF-1, because they induce different responses and diff have different pathological endpoints. Uh, that's not easy to do, but it's something that if we're going to talk about IGF-1, uh, we, we have to be able to... Uh, be at that level of depth. Um, and so IGF-1 has specific windows during, during the lifespan that are important. Um, I find it intriguing that there are such highly specific sex effects. Uh, the gender effects are uh, pronounced, okay? And I think it's an area of further investigation. And these are the people that actually do a lot of the work um, uh, and uh, Zoltan is right there, of course, and Nicole Ashpole, who uh, did the, uh, the yeoman's job of analyzing all the data that UG sent, okay, putting it into a massive spreadsheet and uh, uh, sending it over to the, to the statisticians. Uh, Anna is somewhere hiding, there she is, okay, and Arlen is somebody you folks know well, hiding it in the background. And so, um, you know, I, I'm really thankful for all of, of the people that participated and actually made this study work. Don't forget, geroscience is coming. Geroscience is coming. Um, January 1st, um, I'm editor-in-chief, which means I need to bug people for papers. Okay, and uh, so it's um, uh, November 1st, okay? So if you want to have the honor of being in the inaugural edition, Jan uh, November 1st, I need papers. Right, Veronica? Okay, you got that down, right? November 1st, on vacation, you're writing, correct? UG, okay? Jim? Randy? <laughs> November 1st. Now, now, let's not get nasty. <laughs> we actually will not have that for a year. Yeah. Right. But what I will tell you, if you do your job, it's going to be high. Okay? So anyway, with that, I'll close. Thank you very much, folks. And I prefer not to talk about Oklahoma football, okay? <laughs> I, I'm a little bit peeved. Okay, go ahead. Okay, are we talking about cognitive function? Okay, here's what, what we've done. And the short answer is, yes, we have. 
Okay? And um, what we found, we've done this because when the first study was done was a direct infusion of IGF-1 to brain. And it worked. We got improvements in cognitive function. Then we went and we gave growth hormone two pulses per day for, um, uh, I forgot how long that was. It was at least a month. And that improved cognitive function. Then I had this grand idea that kind of, in hindsight, sounded a little bit archaic. But can we prevent age-related decline in, um, I'm sorry, in cognitive function by giving GHRH? It was the cheapest alternative because you could buy the peptide. And so we did that. We did two injections of GHRH per day starting at nine months of age and going to 22 months of age. That improved, prevented the, the decline in cognitive function with age. Okay? So we've done it all, all three. The, the cheapest way to do it, um, or the most cost effective, I should say, is with GHRH. What I don't know is if you know, what I worry about is, is there a loss of response to GHRH long term? Um, if I started it too late, would I still get the, get the same e effect? Um, and so that's why we started that one fairly early. And so we have done all three, and they always improve cognitive function, okay? And we have colleagues that have done work with Inject, uh, in, um, uh, replacement of GHRH in human models shown positive effects on cognitive function. So, you know, there are multiple endpoints, multiple uh, strains, different rodent models that have been used, all consistently show the same effect. And so that's why in the Ames dwarf, I don't know what the difference is. Is it the paracrine IGF-1? Well, it very well could be. The other is the uh, behavioral task, which, you know, um, I'm sensitive to. Okay, so. Yes. Lateral ventricle. Lateral ventricle. And we showed that in the tissue in the hippocampus, we had an increase in the concentrations of IGF-1 in the hippocampus, okay, 